Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesdays at 12 in Randy's office where we are answering your questions and uh, we're glad you're with us on this pre-hurricane kind of day. Is it, it's like kind of spooky out there actually, Randy. Have you been out? No. It's like just dark. Well, and, other than to come in. Yeah, it's dark and gloomy and I don't know, probably still a little bit rainy too, but we're glad you're tuned in with us. And let me just give a little special shout out to mom and dad. Hi, mom and dad. <laughs> They're watching today, so I want to okay. make sure I said hi. That's the privileges of being the aunt question person. I get to give a shout out to my mom and dad. You do. Would y'all like me to ask some questions now? I'll do that. Let us know you're here. Okay, here we go. Number one, first question deals with Sunday's message. So how do you stay focused on sharing the gospel without becoming overbearing? Your message was about intensity and sharing and mm -hmm. uh, God's word and so forth. Um, I, I think the person is kind of answering the question because they are aware that there's that danger. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we have to just try to stay sensitive and ask ourselves, is this feeling like abnormal communication or is this feeling like, okay, this is legitimate conversation, the person knows me, we have some background, you, you know, th those kinds of things. I'm watching the person's emotional responses. Are they comfortable? Are they becoming uncomfortable? You, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of things. And so I think staying prayerfully self-aware uh, of what you're saying and how the other person is reacting is, is about as good as we can do with these things. And, you know, there, there's not like a, a mechanistic model that we can look at. It's going to be different with every situation. For example, there are people that when they just see strangers in places, they feel like they need to accost them mm -hmm. and <laughs> talk to them about their eternal destiny. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe some people are led by God to do that and do it okay, but for most of us, that would be very inappropriate and mm -hmm. offensive, and we would come across as fanatical or weird. So, this is hard to answer as though there's one simple answer. I think yeah. you've got to develop um, heightened sensitivity. Maybe pray to God will help you to be very sensitive. And mm -hmm. when you think you're, uh, it's time to say something, maybe pray before you do and say, God, you know, should I go forward? Should I say less? Should I say more? Mm -hmm. Look at it in terms of a process that you might just say a thing or two, and then God may bring somebody else into the person's life next week, next month, next year even that might take it a step further. But don't think in terms of I have to get the person across the finish line, right. you know, to the place where they turn to Christ today. Uh, sometimes we are allowed that, that experience, but many times not. You know. Yeah, probably a pretty good sign, and I mean this seriously, even though it's kind of funny, but if they start avoiding you, <laughs> you know, like sure. a, a friend or a family member who just you kind of sense they don't want to, you know, they're like rolling their eyes, like here they come again, yeah. that's a pretty good sign that you're probably just... Yeah, and, and, and to pick up on that a bit, uh, I think sometimes we get stuck on one person yeah. and we just keep going back to them again and again. And, and every conversation, we twist it toward that subject. Yeah. I'd be careful with that. It ought to feel normal. There ought yeah. to be some indication that they're interested, that they're asking questions, that they're comfortable with the conversation, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. All right, second question. Are all Ten Commandments represented in the New Testament and then they have particularly the Sabbath. And let me just connect another question we had come in. How about observing the Sabbath and Shabbat? So kind of connect there just, I guess, a general question about the Sabbath. Yeah, well, um, again, if you look at the Sabbath as a judicial law that God gave, that, that's the concern that sometimes it's like, oh, he said we need to do this. It was part of the Ten Commandments. We better do that or he's going to be really displeased. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. If you look at it like, God looked at us and said, we tire out, just like we tire out in a 24-hour period and, and we have to sleep. We tire out in a seven-day period and it's good to rest a day and, you know, to reflect on, on God and so forth. Now, in the New Testament, it specifically says that we are not, in the book of Colossians chapter 2, we are, we are not to be judged on the Sabbath anymore at all. That, that's not part of... Um, the developmental path of spirituality that God intends for us. Uh, okay, so, so we're not judged by all these little uh, ceremonial type of things that the nation of Israel were given as, mm -hmm. as part of their identity. And again, the law to Israel, the Ten Commandments, it, it was a partial revelation of God. It was meant to build their trust in Him, and it was meant to be kind of a protective mechanism to keep them from doing things too, too darn destructive and, um, and ultimately give them, them an awareness 
that there was something broken in them because it's so hard to keep even the ten. Mm -hmm. um, there were actually 613 that were given to the nation of Israel. And when you come to the New Testament, there's literally over a thousand commands. Uh, I once knew, I think it's 1,069. So if you look at these commands, let's take the New Testament. Are, are, is the Sabbath repeated in the New Testament? Not, not really. Okay. Should we take a day to gather with God's people to worship? Yes, that's specifically stated. But it's not stated in terms of a judicial necessity. Uh, it just says, hey, the disciples started meeting together on the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose again from the grave. You know, Paul talks to Corinthians. He says, hey, when you get together on the first day of the week, uh, put aside some money for the collection and the work of God and all like that. He just kind of casually says it because it was already happening. He doesn't say it like it had to be done or God's mm -hmm. displeased with you. You know, so. Uh, with the thousand or more commands that we have in the New Testament, what, what, what I don't know is what's in this person's mind. If, if they're thinking, I want to be very careful to make sure I'm keeping all of God's commands because I think that if I don't keep His commands, He's not going to be pleased with me and I'm not sure what that means. It might mean that He won't bless me or He might cast me off or something like that. If they're thinking that way, they're thinking incorrectly. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking, gee, there's a thousand or more commands in the New Testament, and they are all from a loving Father who is saying, you want to know how love acts in this situation, here it is. You want to know how love acts in that situation, here it is. Here's a thousand different ways that love acts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not like I'm trying to live up to some judicial standard to save my skin but I, I am being coached by a loving father. I am being parented by a loving father. Here's the way life works, my mm -hmm. son, my daughter. Um, so that's what would concern me is because this has a little bit of a feel to me like maybe the person is, is struggling with some fear about pleasing mm -hmm. God as opposed to, oh, uh, these are God's uh, expressions uh, of, uh, of love. They show us what he's like and they show us how to love in uh, unusual situations, you know. So. And with, with that in mind, all of the Ten Commandments, like you say, taking the Sabbath is something different. Um, the other the other nine would be represented in New Testament. They absolutely right? are. Don't, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Don't, be, don't covet. You yes. know, honor your mother and father. Yes. And, and, and the Sabbath the is in the sense that we need one out of seven to just chill. We, mm -hmm. we, we need some time to chill to re recharge. It's no different, like I say, than you have to stop in any 24-hour period. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he could have put that as commandment, thou shalt sleep, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but we just kind of can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can go 24 set, well, not 24 seven, but we can go seven, seven days, days a week, yeah. and it's not good for, um, for our souls, you know. Yeah. So, so he, and again, it's not like a judicial thing, but it's saying you better find some space to take care of your soul, re mm. regather your energy in there and some space where you're going to be God-centered because in this world, you usually have to work, most of human history, people work from sun up to sun down. Mm -hmm. Seven days a week was very easy to do. So he's saying, just just stop on one day. Mm -hmm. You know, your crops are going to be okay. Just stop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think one of the hard things, even when we get what we, we consider a day off work, we still just busy ourselves so much and stuff. We don't really, that, that you know, I find that hard to do that to really yeah. carve out some rest for my soul. Well, you know, in, in, in enjoyable things still. And, and, and that's the only thing I, 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 would, I would say as a caveat is that sometimes those things relax you. You're, 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 you're enjoying what you're doing and so right. you're, you're, you're still relaxed. So I, I don't want to make this this rigid thing that requires don't move, right. don't move. Right. <laughs> if you're moving, you're breaking the Sabbath principle. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's like, no, find something that relaxes you and make sure that at least one day in your seven days you are focused on God. As a Christian, you ought to be focused on Him every day to some degree, but maybe one day that you concentrate a little special effort. For us, most of us, we, we say, well, that's Sunday. We gather with God's people and so forth. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, this person asks, what is the discrepancies about God's name? Should we use his Hebrew names or does it not matter? Does it, does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter? <laughs> Do you want to even explain anything? No, um, I don't. It, it, it's, I think it's an overcomplication. Here, here, here's the thing. You have different names for God in the Old Testament. Sometimes they're emphasizing his power, mm -hmm. sometimes his uh, eternality and things like that. But when you come to, come to the New Testament, it says, okay, all the fullness of God, 
dwelt in Jesus in physical bodily form. And so now we, we know if you want to have a name for God, the name that he has taken to himself is Jesus. You want to know who I am, you want to know what I'm like, as much as you'll ever be able to take in, it's in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to get, you know, uh, fixated on a name, that that would be the one. Now, mm -hmm. you know, we know scripturally there's the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, but um, the, the idea of the name in the Old Testament New, it, it's, it's the revelation of God's character. Well, now his character has been fully revealed. So these fragmentary names like, you know, the, the names that are shown that he was uh, the, the provider, the Lord, mm -hmm. what, Jehovah Nisi and all these things, you know, mm -hmm. Christians just crack me up. I mean, they read books and they get all these names and I don't know, they think they're, it's going to stir their spirituality on and, and it's just showing that there was a fragmentary, partial, uh, progressive revelation that God was giving him himself in the Old mm -hmm. Testament. Now we've got the fullness in Christ. Why would we ever want to go back yeah. to the fragments? Yeah. But some Christians feel like you're really spiritual if you, if you talk to God in Hebrew names. <laughs> you know what I mean? I guess I didn't understand the question meaning with the term discrepancies because there's no discrepancy. It's he's, None that like I'm, you say, it's all revealing these different yes. the aspects of God's character. So yeah. he shows himself here, here, and there. Yeah, Jehovah the Jireh, the provider, yeah. and Jehovah yeah. Nisi, and you know, all, all these things. They're just showing different manifestations of God in different circumstances showing more and more uh, what His it's, character is. Yeah. He's our provider, He's our protector, he's, he's the Almighty, you know, all these things. Yeah. But we have it all uh, completely made clear to us in Jesus. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, here we go. Reading 2 Timothy 3.15. So this person sort of makes a long statement and then at the end, they're basically asking, is this the correct interpretation? Okay, so here's what they say. I think, I think they meant First Timothy, but oh, okay. But, but I, 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 without checking, I, yeah. but, but let's go with it. I, I know okay. the portion of Scripture they're talking about. Maybe it is Second Timothy, because now th they're correct, because it's talking, Paul is talking to Timothy about Timothy's childhood okay. and, and about his mother Lois uh, and, and his grandmother Eunice, if I recall. But, but go ahead. Okay, so that's good context there. So then it says, Upon creation as spiritual beings, the Holy Scriptures are sown in our hearts to make us wise for salvation. So we know from the beginning right from wrong, but we were created with a free will to choose to be saved and come back into a trusting relationship with God our Creator. Wow, our spiritual DNA right there. And then they said, correct interpretation with a question mark. Yeah, I'm, I don't mean to be insulting, but it, it's, it's not the correct interpretation, and it's an example of how dangerous it is to have spiritual ideas in our mind and then read a portion of Scripture and impose those ideas mm -hmm. without reading the passage in its context. As, as I said a minute ago, Paul is talking to Timothy in this particular uh, passage and he's, and he's causing Timothy to think back to his childhood. He says, Timothy, from your earliest days you knew the Holy Scriptures which are able to make us wise unto salvation. So Paul is talking about the fact that Lois and Eunice, his, uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother, took what would have been at that time the Old Testament and they taught the Old Testament to Timothy, the Scriptures. He was not saying that they were already in his heart at all. He's talking about a, a specific situation and he's saying <clears throat> those Scriptures that were already in your heart, they were, they were uh, potent to make you wise unto salvation. They, they gave you plenty of reason to return to your Creator and trust in Him, which is what salvation is when we return to our Creator and trust. So, the spiritual DNA, if you want to use a term which I do use it a lot these days, it, it's the notion that we are made in the image of God and even though the image is broken, there are faint traces of that image that still show through and, and we respond sometimes to things um, because there, there's still the faint, uh, I'm going to again make a term up that's not in the Bible, mm -hmm. like a spiritual memory that's there. It, it, it's like this, this fading memory and we hear certain things it's like we respond to it because it's like it's speaking to that image that we were meant to wear perfectly that we now only wear in a fragmentary way. Now, when we return to Christ our Creator and trust, God starts to rebuild that image and we become fully human and fully alive if we continue to progress and walk with Him. So. Okay. All right, next question. Does our earthly marriage matter in heaven? <coughs> Meaning, are we <coughs> aware of our spouse? I hear people say it doesn't matter, but God talks about the restoration of His kingdom. Wouldn't perfect unions be a part of that? Well, 
here's the thing. I, I know what the person referred to. There's this portion of scripture where the, the um, I think it was a Sadducee. Yes, it was a Sadducee because they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. It, they were trying to trap Jesus. This is getting close to the end of his ministry where they were looking for reason to crucify him and so forth. And Sadducee says, oh, Master, I have this question of you, you know, acting all, you know, pious and everything. There was this guy, had this wife, and she died. And then he had another wife, and she died. And, another, another, another. and, and after the five, oh, Master, who will be his wife in the resurrection? Because this guy didn't believe in the resurrection. And Jesus answered to him, he says, um, you neither understand God nor the Holy Scriptures. He's, and he's, he's, but then Jesus says, so that you do understand. He says, in the resurrection, and this is where everybody gets thrown, they will be like the angels. Or they will neither marry nor give in marriage. Okay? So from that text, many believe that, that, that we're going to be turned into angels, which right. is not what Jesus meant. Okay. But what he was saying is something unique and, and lots of troubling ideas have resulted from this. Okay, some have thought, based on what his response was, well, there won't be any marriage in heaven, and so here you've traveled through your earthly sojourn with one person, mm -hmm. you've forged a relationship with them, a very intimate relationship, going through all kinds of ups and downs together, but all of a sudden you don't know them up there. You, 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 oh, hi, have we met? No, no. <laughs> you know, that's ridiculous because uh, we see examples where people know each other, you know, so we're, we know for a fact we are absolutely going to know everybody uh, in heaven. We're going to know each other. We're, we are going to re remember. Some take from Isaiah 66, the former things will be remembered no more. They, they take it that, oh, you're not going to remember that you were married to the person. You're not going to remember who they are. It's, it's not what Scripture is teaching. So the real question becomes, well, what will these relationships be like? I mean, let's take the Sadducees' example. That probably has happened. Okay, so if they're all in heaven together, how do they function? How do they relate? Um, I think what is so hard for us to understand is, is how that relationships in heaven will be stronger than the strongest here on this earth. And, and one of the reasons why is because we will we will have perfect understanding of ourselves, perfect understanding of others, perfect understanding of God and reality. We'll be in an environment that is completely safe. No more sin, sorrow, pain, death, none of these things. No more guilt, no more shame, no more confusion. And so it's hard for us to imagine, but, but I believe we will have a far stronger relationship with everyone we, we meet in heaven, but this will not diminish the kind of very special relationship we had with certain people on earth, whether it was a best friend or a brother or sister or, or, or a husband or a wife. Mm -hmm. What that will look like, I don't know, but the memory certainly will not be erased. Uh, all we know is that whatever positive feelings existed here, they will just be amplified probably a thousandfold there, but it will be more of a, a, a community where everybody will feel so bonded together that the distinctive relationship, that, that, that on earth, you know, we, we only have time and capacity to relate to a few people, you know, I intimately, mm -hmm. honestly. And so most of us will polarize with one or two, you know what I mean, and then we might have five or ten close friends, maybe ten or twelve at most or something like that. It's all we have capacity for, time for. Heaven, that will be very different. Our capacity will be greatly enlarged. And I think the kind of, um, the kind of wonderful relationships that will exist there are a little bit hard for us to imagine now. And so th this is one of those things that probably all of us would like to know more than what Scripture has revealed to us, but here's what we can count on. It's, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be better than anything we can imagine. I mean, it's not going to be like you've uh, gone through life with your spouse and you love your spouse dearly and then you get up to heaven and you're just like strangers. Yeah, I I exactly, because heaven is only going to make every relationship better. And the memories, like I say, there's no reason to believe they're, they're going to be gone other than maybe some painful things, you know. Yeah, yeah it's just fascinating to see, to imagine what it's actually going to be like. You know, like yeah, and I, I'm, I'm going to make sure I answer this person's question. Um, okay, I, I, I guess I did. I guess I did. Yeah, I think as best as it can be. I, I think yeah. so. Okay, our last question we have, unless any others have come in. Okay. 
um, is teaching his wife about spiritual things that she may not know or be aware of the responsibility of the husband. Is it a husband's responsibility to do that? Um, should he take that on or should he just rest assured that God will handle the situation of dealing with someone who seems a little out of touch spiritually? So how much does a husband, how far does he go in terms of? Well, I, I find it interesting and I'd, I'd be eager for the person to show me where it says that a husband is supposed to. It's God's command. It's his, it's his intention. It's his plan for a husband to teach his wife. I don't know where that's at. Would I, someone, you know, the whole idea of the man should be the spiritual leader of the home, is that perhaps then? If they take Ephesians 5, um, where it says the husband is the head of the wife, mm -hmm. as Christ is the head of the church, it certainly establishes the notion of, um, of leadership in a home. There, there has to be order, there has mm -hmm. to be coordination. Um, does that mean that the husband is to teach? What if the husband doesn't have a teaching gift? I, I think there's, there's been a lot of, in my opinion, very bad teaching on this. And it, and it starts mm -hmm. back to uh, a, a conference that used to go around all around the country called Basic Youth Conflicts. And it taught this umbrella concept. And, and so, so all I'm trying to say is this. It, it sounds to me like in this particular case, this person's wife is not eager to learn. And this particular man thinks his wife is not as spiritual or not as spiritually learned as she should be. And so he feels like he needs to tell her things and teach her things. And that may or may not be true, but I can say this for sure, if she's not eager to learn from him, unless she's coming to him and saying, you know, I'd really like you to teach me, I don't think he's under any kind of a mandate to do so. And in fact, he might damage his marriage. And I get the feel here that he's looking at his wife and has the feeling that she needs to improve spiritually or be enlightened more mm -hmm. and she doesn't quite know that it's his job to do it and I'm telling him it's not his job to do it okay. because she, she has the same spiritual opportunities to grow. She has access to God's Word. Mm -hmm. She's a, a mature human being who can exercise her free will. If she is asking him, I want to reiterate it, if she's asking him, you know, I really want you to teach me a scripture. Please teach me a scripture. Right. I'll sit. I'll be teachable. I'll listen. I'll ask questions. But I just need somebody to teach me. That's cool. That's wonderful. It doesn't sound like what we have here. Uh, if I'm misunderstanding, I apologize. But the, the fact that it says the handle situation dealing with someone who seems a little out of touch spiritually. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means, out of touch spiritually, but it sounds like he feels like he needs to clue her in on some things, mm -hmm. which is fine if she wants to be clued in. If not, he might be creating more trouble for himself than he needs to, mm -hmm. and it may not succeed at all because mm -hmm. she, may not be, she may not be interested. She may not be open. She may, she may not listen. She, she may, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and, and, and some people can receive from some people they can't receive from others. Right. You know, some wives could receive from their husbands. Others could not. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you uh, say that? Because, I mean, you hear that a lot. Men are taught to be the spiritual leader in your home. You, need, you know, men need to rise up and be the spiritual leader. Be the, so what would that look like then for a man to be that? In my mind, that looks like you model it by your own complete surrender to Christ, your own devotion to the kingdom of God, your own uh, righteous behavior, mm -hmm. your, your provision and protection of your household, your, your love for those that are under your roof. Uh, they see in you a righteous man. They, they see a model. They see you're gentle and strong. They, they see all these things. They see you get yourself up you know, and go to church and you're committed and you're in God's Word and God's Word is in you and it, it's what's forming your ideas and your values and your habits and your priorities. Um, I think that's what Scripture is teaching. I do not, in fact, it makes me a little nervous when I, like I say, I, I can't remember the guy's name and I was trying to, going through my head, but he had this basic, basic youth conflicts. Good, good, Bill, uh, Go Bill Gothard. Gothard yeah. Bill Gothard started this notion and I am uncomfortable with it, never been comfortable with it, mm -hmm. don't think it's biblical, so, um, so be cautious. Yeah. 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 Model it versus teaching and yes. imposing now, it. Yes, now if, it. If, if you have a wife that says, gee, you know the Bible so well and yeah. you've walked with God so long, I, I want you to teach me and I'll sit and I'll be teachable and listen. Yeah. That's cool, man, go for it. Mm -hmm. If that's not happening, um, make sure that you're 
modeling it and giving your wife opportunities. You know, if you've got a Bible around, you, you urge your household to go to church. Hey, we're, we're all, we're all going to get up and go to church on Sunday. You know, I think, I think a man should do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I even have ideas about, and I know that people have different views of, well, what do you do with teenagers and, you know, once they get older and how do you handle this? Mm -hmm. I, I'm like old school on this. If you're under my roof, you know, this is what we do. Now, is the wife included in that? No, no, you, you can't okay, make it. You can't right. make an adult. I just it, it sounded no. like I think somebody could take in that that you made no, everybody. No, no, I'm saying kids, kids, children, children yeah. are still dependent. Uh, you know, in, in there, I, I, that that's me, yeah. and even that is probably not wise in a lot of situations. If you, if you, let's face it, once a kid turns 12 or 13, the only real power or authority you have in that kid's life is is persuasion. Mm -hmm. If the kid wants to defy you, you can't do a thing, mm -hmm. and so. So to be realistic, if you have a child who is a teenager and they just, they just refuse to go to church, you can't do anything about it. Right. You know, you can sit them down, you can talk with them, you can plead with them, but after that, you probably just have to let it go. Okay. All right, we had a question come in on the comments, okay. and it's our friend Melissa. Hey, Melissa. <laughs> um, Melissa. Anything with to go to FCF, Nephilim? Moved away. Dancing so, Melissa. Um, yeah, there we go. So, my husband and I read through the God-Shaped Heart. I know that's exciting. Okay. We really enjoyed the thought exercise, especially the levels one to seven thing. And I know you're going to yes. address that when you... Uh, but unless we're misunderstanding, we're stumbling on the lack of hell idea. Are you able to put that opinion into your own words to try to smooth over how he seems to have to, to ignore some scripture to get there? What yeah. did we miss? Uh, there are several chapters in the God-Shaped Heart that... Um, you know, when, when, when I urge our people to read it, I'm, I'm going to specifically talk about that I don't think uh, I agree with. I don't think they're necessarily biblical. Now, when it comes to um, hell, one of the things that the writer believes in, and, and, and in my mind, it is an absolute uh, rooted in Scripture alternative view of, of, of judgment, if we want to use that term. So, so there's two, two different views, essentially. There's probably more than two, but, but let's just look at two. The one view is the traditional evangelical biblical view, and it's that uh, at the end, you know, people will be judged and they'll be uh, punished in the lake of fire uh, based on, you know, what, what their misdeeds were. Their punishment will be different. Some will be more severe than others. But the one thing that will be the same is they will be in the lake of fire forever, consciously awake in the lake of fire, very uncomfortable. Uh, we might use the word tortured for eternity. That, that's the typical evangelical um, accepted picture of hell, the lake of fire, whatever you want to call it. You know, that, that if you reject Christ, you're going to be in the lake of fire, you're going to suffer, you're going to be tortured eternally. All right. The second position that I think is absolutely equally valid from Scripture is something that's been around, but it hasn't gotten as much attention from evangelical community through the years as it is now. It's getting a lot more attention right now. It's not a compromise. It's not liberalism. It's people that are searching the Scripture and seeing from Scripture there could be another view of this, and it's called annihilationism. It is based on the multiple passages of Scripture that say things like the wicked will perish, the wicked will be destroyed, they'll be gone forever, uh, the, the fire consumes them and they are no more. Jesus even said at one point, he said, don't worry about those that um, can kill the body but worry about him who can kill both body and soul in hell. Destruction, annihilation, non-existence. And so the way annihilationism goes is this, is there absolutely will be a judgment. The judgment will be exacting based on uh, a person's misdeeds. But after they have uh, paid for uh, their, their misdeeds, you know, they, they've, they've experienced exact justice, whatever that means from God's standpoint, uh, then they are consumed and they go out of existence forever. Now let me just, before everybody jumps and thinks like, well, gee, that doesn't sound very severe, um, let, me, let me show you what is severe sounding to me. All right, if I live on this earth for 100 years and I break every one of God's laws that I possibly can deliberately, inten intentionally, for my 100-year life, I'm an evil, evil, evil person for 100 years. I can do a lot of evil. I can do a lot of damage. I, I can affect millions of people if I'm Adolf Hitler, you know. So, therefore, for me to be receive judgment, punishment for my sins, um, it's going to take a long time, okay? But how long? Okay, so 
I sinned for a hundred years and I affected millions of people maybe and I need to experience justice for that, but how long will that take? Um, will that take 200 years? Will it take 300 years? Maybe it'll take a thousand years. I did a lot of damage. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll take 10,000 years, million years. Do you suppose in a million years I could experience justice for the sins that I committed in a hundred? Or, or is it already sounding disproportionate? Is it already sounding unjust? If I sin for a hundred years and God tortures me for eternity, does that sound unjust? Because God says He's just and He's fair. So, frankly, the first position that is the most accepted amongst Christians is on some shaky legs. There's only two portions of Scripture, only two. One is in Matthew 25, one is in the book of Revelation that specifically use the language of eternal torment and even both of those can be explained, whereas there's probably hundreds that talk about the destruction of the wicked, the, you know, the perishing, the non-existence. So, would it make God seem more just, perhaps, if He, in His love and mercy, He saw to it that those that reject His love and mercy and who have done such damage to other humans, you know, Jesus, I mean, Scripture says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, say the Lord. So, He gives exacting justice, so I sin for a hundred years and I affect millions of people, whatever that means, I, I pay for that. But maybe after a thousand years, I'm all paid up. And so then God just causes me to cease from existing. The eternal fires put me eternally out of existence. Um, that's the, the position of annihilationism. I think it's got a lot going for it. I think it makes God look more just. I think it makes God look more merciful, which we know He is. It, it takes um, some of the really dark, hard to explain things uh, out of the way. Now, I want to I want to say this: if if humans are made immortal, all right then you need a prison colony, a place of incarceration for eternity. That's what I had always seen the lake of fire to be, a, a prison colony for the re rebellious so that they could not go out and destroy the new heaven and the new earth. All right, But where does it say we're immortal? Where, where does it, I mean, think about this. When, when Adam and Eve broke trust with God when they sinned, God has them barred from the Garden of Eden, and He specifically says, I'm, I want to put them out of here lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. They're barred by an angel with a flaming sword so that they don't, live, they don't have immortality. The notion that humans are born with immortality is really a Greek teaching from about the third century B.C. It's, 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 not, it's not Hebrew in root. Mm -hmm. um, are there, are there other portions of Scripture that indicate that immortality is something we don't possess but it can be given to us? How about Romans 6.23? The wages or results, the inevitable consequences, if you want to look at it, of sin is death, but the free gift of God is everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So we don't possess everlasting life, it's a free gift given to us. Um, Romans 2 talks about those that seek immortality. They don't have immortality. They seek it. Mm -hmm. So, two positions. Uh, I'm, I'm totally fine with, with whatever per place a person lands because they are both based on scriptural study. It's somebody trying to be honest with what God has taught in His Word. The one is the traditional position that the person that rejects uh, the love of God, they, they are in the lake of fire, this eternal prison colony forever, and they are in torment forever or annihilationism. They experience the exact justice that their sins deserve since they rejected God's mercy, but then they are uh, destroyed forever. They go out of existence. All right. There's your answer. I will say one other thing. There, there are some other positions that the writer takes in the book that I think are also things that I would not exactly agree with. He, he, he does a lot of uh, in one, ch one chapter, he, he dedicates a lot of it to, to the topic of homosexuality, and I actually r wrote the writer uh, of the book myself, and he was very gracious and responded to me quickly. And, um, but his answer was not conclusive, and, and the problem is this. Even though there are some scientific evidences that, that now make certain physical conditions uh, as contributive to what we would call homosexual behavior, in the New Testament, we didn't have any of these scientific breakthroughs, and so all the, the Christian communities were told to judge by was what we see to be 
this behavior and, and it was categorized as not God's highest and best or sin. So uh, he, he, he deals with a few areas that are, that are controversial that I would not agree with. All in all, I think it's an extraordinarily good book, particularly the part that she mentions about the seven laws of moral development. Yeah. Um, Melissa follows up with a question, too, for clarification. So when the author talked about no hell in that book, you think he's going for that annihilationism? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I know that he, he is an annihilationist. Now, where he may differ from me on annihilation and other annihilationists, other annihilationists are very clear about the exacting justice. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Yeah. All right. He may, and, and I haven't spoken, didn't write him on this, anything was worthwhile. He may even go further than that, that, that annihilationism doesn't necessarily include the exact justice. Albeit, though, I think he says in a few places in his other books, maybe, that there is justice, there is judgment, and then ultimate, ultimately annihilationism, but I'm, but I'm not sure. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, we're winding down here. That was our last question, and so maybe want to just give us a, a, we're continuing in our series this week about keys to becoming fully human, fully alive, and this week Yeah, this, this week it's, it's humility, and um, we probably never think of humility as being a key to becoming fully human and fully alive, but, but without humility, uh, we can't even embrace reality, or we are not in, we are not embracing reality. We can't be taught, uh, we're not easily shaped, and more, more tragically, we deprive ourselves of things like love, joy, peace, kindness, uh, faithfulness, all, all those things called the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, with that humility, they cannot grow, they, they won't. And these are wonderful things to have going on inside of us, you know, and, uh, and humility is the key to, uh, to having those experiences. So, so that's where we're going this week. All right. We want to remind you that growth group registration is underway, so we want so much for every single person to, to be in a growth group uh, through this fall semester. It's just a wonderful growth opportunity and chance to build relationships with other people too. And then Rediscover Sunday is coming up in two weeks. And on Sunday, you filled out some little prayer cards. Those have been divided up among our staff, and we are praying for those people that you are inviting. So join us in prayer, too. Pray for your own courage to step out there and invite. And let's just make Rediscover Sunday a really big, big Sunday here at FCF. Sound good, Randy? Wonderful for me. All right. I think that's all we got for today. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on Sunday.